Welcome to Open Source Spotlight. We invite open source authors and ask them to show the tools they're working on. Today we have Brent. Hi Brent, tell us a few words about yourself and about the tool you want to show us. Hi Alexi. Uh, today I'm going to show you a distributed file system. It's called the Juice FS. Let me share my screen right now. So Juice FS is a cloud native database, uh, cloud native uh, high performance distributed file systems. We are building on top of uh, all the cloud providers. We're also supporting some uh, the bare metal deployments. Our high performance is based on our uh, heavily developed the caching system and our uh, distributed locks. So let me go directly into uh, the demo and show you how to uh, start and use our file system. For the real uh, real life performance, you will probably going to try by yourself. Let me do this. Uh, this is our uh, official uh, website, juicefs.com. Our uh, I will start in with the community edition today. So let me make it larger. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, JuiceFS is built on, uh, originally it's built on, on the same idea of HDFS. So we are uh, something different. This is, we are fully uh, POSIX compatible. So basically if you have a legacy uh, application or you have some local application developed in uh, just for a small amount of the data, this a feature will give you a, the maximum flexibility. You can use that directly in a cloud environment. And the does other it mean uh, POSIX, POSIX compatible? Does it mean like if I have a Unix Linux system, I can just mount it yes. to some file path and use it as a usual? Uh, yes. I can yes. just do CD and all that. Stuff. Yeah, just a CD, make DAR, do everything the uh -huh. regular file system you can do. Because like with the Hadoop, uh, you needed to have like to use the, the Hadoop tool, right? To actually do yes. this. Yes, uh -huh. Hadoop and is is a read-only file system. You cannot mm -hmm. modify the file. If you want to uh -huh. modify, you have to copy all of them. It's basically a, a, a write over, uh, like change on write system. But mm -hmm. our file system is different. We are fully compatible with the POS extender. And uh, uh, I would like to point out the other ones, we have a strong consistency. So unlike uh, other, like, like unlike the, the normal distributed systems, some of the system is the eventual consistency. So you commit something, but only one client can see the change. But in our file system, we can see all the changes once you have one client coming to the file and the, all the other client will see the file changes immediately. Yeah, uh, I will skip all this uh, like PowerPoint-like show. I will show the architecture here. Uh, basically, we are building on top of a metadata, concept of the metadata and uh, uh, our data store. Our metadata engine supports variables, uh, different kind of the database structures. And uh, our data store is basically a key value store. So the most popular one for the starter is using a Redis as a metadata engine, S3 as a data engine. And we have a software building on top of this two type of the database and the uh, mount as a POSIX file system. I will show a demo about this side, like FUs mounting a JuiceFS system into a local, I will run an EC2 instance. I will also show uh, uh, running a Kubernetes CSI driver. So uh, we can share the file system between uh, a regular EC2, maybe it's running locally or in the cloud providers and uh, share the same file system with Kubernetes. Okay, let's jump directly into our demo today. Uh, this is our, uh, I would say, let's do this. Go to quick start installation. So installation is pretty simple. I will show the, the resources we are going to use today. We have 
uh, EC2 instance here. Let's copy this IP address. I'm gonna make a note, then go back to here. Uh, we will use S3 as our uh, key value store. This is the S3 URL. I have the note here. Uh, we are not going to use a Redis today. We're going to try a little bit harder. This is uh, basically uh, a high performance setup. This is the uh, uh, PostgreSQL database. The PostgreSQL database running on AWS RDS. And this is, uh, yeah, okay, everything is correct. This is the entry point. And this is the core number. And in the last part of the demo, I will show you how to use the CSI driver and the mounting into this EKS cluster. This is a newly created EKS cluster. Okay, let me do this. I'll go to the document. And make this a lot larger. Thanks. Keep the demo here. Let's SH into that EC2 instance. So this is just an EC2 instance. You didn't do anything special with this instance, right? No, it's just an EC2. You, you see, this is the first time I log into this EC2 instance. I just created this one. Nothing special. And copy paste into the install process. So all, then let me go into distributed mode. So now you have just FS, the command line here. Juice FS command support, like mount. This will be the, the last command we're going to use. But before we mount, we need to format this drive first. So we're going to hands-on practice. Install the client, prepare the object storage. We have S3, we have this already. And uh, the access key, access the secret. I have one copied here. Let me copy this and paste it into. You will remove the key right after the demo yeah i will remove the key after the demo <laughs> so we will not attempt to mine bitcoin using these keys yeah no worries this, is, this key doesn't have a lot of access and we're going to have a database here this database is uh redis right now in the in the document but we are going to use a postgre database so the fully uh let's prepare that here so the fully ready database will be post press and the username at this one. Yeah, this will be our database URL. And this is our data uh, key value store data uh, URL. Now create a file system. The command is like this. So oh, let me copy this here. Uh, the bucket is this. And we don't need the access key and the secret. That's in the environment variable. And we're going to copy this to replace the Redis. Uh, and we'll see, let's give it a, a different name here. In order to find the, the format of the post agree, I would like to introduce, let's say, uh, we have a reference uh, topic in our community document. In this reference document, we have all the document about how this database engine works. On this page, we have post agree, MySQL, MariaDB. If we go to post agree, here's the format of the post agree database. If you need something 
uh, special parameters. Maybe the database name is different. You have different setup for uh, other database engines. You will need to go here to find all this different setup. We also support like TIKV as the metadata engine. Uh, ETCD is also possible, but the, the really popular one is the Redis and the possibly. Okay, let's do this format. Okay, that's it. The, the, the volume is formatted. Then let's go back to the document, say after format installation. Uh, distributed mode after creating the format we will mount the file system so the mount command I'll copy that here as well it's basically a half of the format command it will be like this and I will mount that to root mnt I will add a dash D so we don't holding this uh, this process. It will be running in the background. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the root. All of this and format and mount this process. It's mounted. Now we can see our mounting point is JuiceSS demo here. Let's do some benchmark now. Uh, let's go to this first. There's an empty now. We can touch A. Then there's a file A. That's the regular file system like you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Let's do some benchmark right now. We can do uh, oh yeah. This is we we're going to use for thread. Uh, what is a benchmark thread? Oh dash p. Sorry, <laughs> it's not dash p, dash p. Now we are going to run uh just as a basic juice fs benchmarking uh, process. I think we don't need that anymore. Let's make this. So it's just writing some big files to the file system, right? Yes. Let's make this. Like just random files, right? Yes. Write large files, small files, and trying to benchmark the, uh, the performance of the file system. So big file, like 700 megabyte per second. Mm -hmm. And small files, uh, like, yeah, small files not very good. <laughs> yeah. So read files is basically similar, like uh, probably this segregates the 10 gig network already. And we can try uh, a different kind of the uh, benchmark. Let's try uh, this one. Let's use DD. Let's write a 10 gig of the file. It takes probably a few seconds. Yeah, like 300 megabytes per. So the, what this command is doing is just, it's getting some random numbers. Yes, getting some random and numbers. The, si the size of the result is uh, 10 gigs, right? Yes, yes. I don't think I ever use DD command. Yeah, this is just like a. I use this to like generally understanding how performance looks like. It's a it's a large file for this one. Mm -hmm. And if we read the file, let's try read the file. Yeah, basically. And now DD is format. moving from that file. Yes. Uh, to, to the oh, or uh, to the void. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is nothing else where so basically just reading the file and the discard. 
It's a pretty advanced usage of Linux to me. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, like I want to show. It's using, very educational. Uh, yeah, using our benchmark to show some detail uh, performance. It's also using the DD command to show uh, this is fully uh, POSIX compatible. So we can use that anywhere. If you have a program, you can read and write the local file. You can work in the uh, just that fast month. And now yeah. if you do ls, uh, what will we have? Uh, we have a uh, this, is ten file. this is the, um, the file you created. Yes. Right? And the, uh, the, the benchmark that you run with JuiceFS, uh, it removes the files from the file system, right? Yes, it will remove the files. Yes. Uh, That's why let we don't me run. Yeah, we can, we can show you uh, when this one is running, we can... Uh, we can find out the, what is inside the accessory bucket. This is the volume name, and mm. we have the chunks. So See? basically, in our uh, practice, all the, all the large files is uh, split into the smaller uh, chunks. All this chunk is stored in the key value databases. Every file is uh, what the size of the file, uh, four megabytes. So basically we are uh, splitting the large file into smaller pieces and mm -hmm. managing all these chunks and the locations with the metadata engine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I'm just trying to figure out, so we needed to specify two things, Postgres, and the bucket, right? Yeah. So like the bucket is where we store the files. Yes. And Postgres is for keeping the metadata, like to which file path, which chunk belongs, or how, how does it work? Like why exactly do we need these both things? Uh, yes, because we need, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we have the strong consistency for the file system. Mm -hmm. We need a place to actually store the locks. That is where ah. we store the locks okay yeah. so if like right now i let's say in this terminal do nano a right to open or via whatever like open it with my favorite uh, text editor does something happen like is there a lock somewhere yes that that's a standard POSIX file uh locks ah, i see i see yeah. if, and you, then... if you have a general linux system you open the file you can now write the file in both uh, you, you can somehow, but you, you need to understand uh, th what is the order of the writing. That's by the standard of the POSIX systems. And we implement that in the distributed way. I see. I see. That's why you need Postgres, right? Yes. And yes. actual files are stored in uh, S3. Yes. Yes. I understand now. Okay. okay. So okay. in a sense, this is a wrapper around S3 that provides... Uh, access control this by access control i mean like this lock mechanism that i and my friend cannot write at the same time to the same file right which s3 yeah. by default does not provide right and then on top of that you also have this POSIX compatibility which s3 does not necessarily have i, I think there are wrappers yes. but like yes. you don't have this out of the box yes yes ST. yeah okay uh, let me show a little bit complexity usage for our uh, uh, EKS mount. So in, in in EKS, I will show you. Uh, let me show here. Uh, this is a fully. Let me go back to my own terminal right now. This is my local right now. Uh, this is a newly created EKS cluster. I installed the CSI driver already. The driver installation is documented here in community, not this community, docs, JUICEFS CSI driver docs. This is a much larger topic, but I will just simplify that to show you how we can mount the same biosystem into our uh, EKS pod. So you can run a Kubernetes load using the same file system. So whoever is interested into how to implement the ECS, uh, the, the CSI driver, go to the doc, 
docs and choose that the docs driver uh, installation person. This uh, we use a how we install it. And, and what is uh, this? What is a CSI driver? Uh, CSI driver is a uh, is a container standard uh, interface. So okay. we can we can use a container storage interface. Mm -hmm. We can okay. use that. We can use the standard to show uh, mm -hmm. how this like like a Docker image. It's a layered. It's mm -hmm. a layered uh, file system. And I see. yeah, Kubernetes have integrated with the CSI uh, driver. If you have your own file system integrating with the EKS, uh, uh, where is it? EKS uh, volume sender, then you can you can mount your own file system into the uh, Kubernetes pod. Mm -hmm. So does it mean like when I run Docker locally, I can just do volume mapping to JuiceFS because it's a POSIX yes. compatible system? Yes. Yes. So this is yes. this is what happens when I run locally. But once I want to move the container I have to Kubernetes, I can also do volume mapping there. Yes. But instead yes. of doing volume mapping to like local JuiceFS uh, mounting point, I would mount to this CSI Thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let me show you how to do that. Now, this is a fully uh, set up Kubernetes driver already. Then we need a pod. So basically, in the pod, we need this. This is uh, our secret. It's just uh, like our mount command, like this. So our command will need to know what's the secret, what's the location of the uh, what's the location of the Postgres, what's the location of our S3. Everything stored. It should be paper. formatted already, right? So it, we assume yes. that we formatted before, and now we just want to mount it to the containers, right? To the yes. pods. Yes, and we will define a Kubernetes storage class here. Uh, make a reference to the secret. We will use uh, we will say the persistence volume claim. That's a PVC. We declare this a PVC using this storage class. And at the last, we will use this PVC to create a PV. And this PV will be mounted into root data in this pod. The pod will be named like Juice FC FPP. Let me apply that. Okay, it's created. Let me see if this is running. Not yet. It's still creating. And uh, I don't remember, but uh, like if you scroll down this YAML file, so there is a command that you will run, right? Uh, uh, no, this so is this is just to keep the pod echo alive. Date. Okay, I see. Yeah, I this see. is no no real use case. This is just to keep uh, the the pod okay. alive. So you don't do this DD stuff there. Yes, yes. I assume yes. we'll Kubernetes just pod, log in to the port. Running somewhere. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Let me see if that is created. Okay, this is running. Uh I have the uh alias here. This is actually poop CTL. Uh it's more bash. Okay, so we have a data. This is the where we're writing the data here mm -hmm. in the in the file. Will be just the all the names from uh, the date. So every five seconds, it'll print a date. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say let's tell the date of txt. It will every every five seconds it will print another one. But in the same time, I will show you let's SSH into our EC2 backend. Remember, we still have the MNT here. Now we have a new directory called PVC. This is the file system we are mounted into the root data here in the Kubernetes pod. Mm -hmm. 
Now in in this right side, we have ops.txt here. Cool. So every time we write a, uh, a new line into the file on the left mm -hmm. side, the right side will keep will read from mm -hmm. this. This mm -hmm. is what we want to show uh, mm -hmm. our file system is strong consistency. There's a one client running in the EKS. There's another one running in the EC2. They have the same file system mounted. Mm -hmm. I'm not super familiar with uh, PVEs and PVCs in uh, Kubernetes. Let's say if now with this setup, I create five replicas of the same pod. Will they all write to the same uh, file or they will write to different folders and then inside each folder there will be a separate oh, file? That, that depends on your uh, PVC setup. If we go back to our document here, uh, installation, we have, we have a basically different kind of the mounting mechanism. You can create a PVC per pod, you can also share the PV. For a replica set, pod. right? Yes. Yes. So basically we have we have a static provisioning or dynamic provisioning and the uh, sidecar mode. Mm -hmm. in, in in the sidecar mode, you can basically use the sidecar to mount any of the files together. So you have mm -hmm. you can have the same sidecar for uh each pod and they share the same root bus. So yeah. currently, with the current setup you have, each pod running a different PVC. Up. Okay, yes. so then yes. it will be a bunch of separate folders. Yes, it will be a bunch of separate folders. But if you so, want to read from uh, mm -hmm. the same folder, you will use a different type of the provisioning. Mm -hmm. I'm using the most simplest one, it's a static provisioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I I was wondering the, why do we actually need this, um, like. Uh, PVCs and uh, in general a file system. What kind of use cases, uh, what kind of problems can I solve with this now? Oh, yeah, uh, that's, that's uh, uh, if we think about the history of like distributed computing, uh, about like more than about 20 years ago when the MapReduce introduced, uh, the storage is much expensive. The, the, the actually the calculation in the CPU cycle, so that is moved closer to the storage. Mm -hmm. That's how the MapReduce works. But yeah. right now, things are different. Like the, our AI training, uh, AI models training, some uh, quantitative analysis, all this kind of the uh, workload, they are pretty heavy on the CPU use case, or maybe a GPU use case, but they don't. They use a small amount of the data, but relatively small but they are working on a large amount of the calculations. So the bottleneck is not the storage at all right now. The bottleneck now is our uh, computing resource. So mm -hmm. we we kind of the in, in between of the different balance compared to Hadoop. So uh, we are not asking all the calculation uh, processes running on the storage node. Now we are moving the data, uh, store the data in the cloud and reading the data into the calculation node. Now, this mm -hmm. is, this is the, a different balance. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe many, many years later, the, the things get changed again. Some mm -hmm. uh, storage becomes more expensive, then maybe we will go back to the different mm -hmm. aspect of the calculation. But this so, is the system is always mm -hmm. like, which where is the bottleneck, then get most of the usage of this kind of resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just want to summarize what you said to make sure I understood. So with Hadoop, the, the idea was that we have a lot of data and sending data to, let's say, my computer yes. when I have the Python script, it yes. takes too much because like we have one terabyte of data and one kilobyte script, right? Mm -hmm. So it's much simpler to distribute this one terabyte across multiple machines and send the same Python script to all of them and just execute yes. them and combine the results. Right. Yes, that's a works. Yeah. But today we deal the workload uh, when we don't speak about big data, but rather like this AI workload. Yeah, let's, right? let's say AI training. Yes. Yeah. AI you, you, training. Have, you have a many, maybe uh, uh, 500 gigabytes of the, uh, the raw mm -hmm. data. 
yeah. you read this 500 data, but you need a lot of GPU mm -hmm. for calculating and uh, uh, iteration on the, all this data. I see, I see. Yeah. So like, the work like, like GPT probably mm -hmm. training or more than a hundred times on the same time mm -hmm. of the data. And they keep mm -hmm. training on the same data side. So calculation mm -hmm. is the bottleneck. Then we move mm -hmm. our data closer mm -hmm. to the calculation now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So because we have a, a GPU. So in the case of MapReduce, we would need to have like a ton of uh, machines each with a GPU, right? So I'm just trying yeah. to understand this. Yeah, but but it, that that that's very old time when the when we all using the spinning drives. That that's a very yeah old topic we have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. so and now, now the loading data them. is much faster, and we saw yeah. this in benchmarks, like because yes. uh, yeah. like our everyone network is much faster right now. Yeah, and because like when we have our EC2 instance in the same data center as our S3, right, we don't even notice that there's network. Yeah, it's we, so don't, we don't notice that. Like mm -hmm. uh, 800 megabytes per second, that is far beyond the uh, like like the spinning drive's capability. That yeah, is, yeah. yeah, that is the network. Uh, mm -hmm. This is also mm -hmm. a network drive, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what you noticed, and this made you realize that, uh, OK, we need a file system to make it more convenient to do yeah. all these sort of trainings. OK. And how many okay. people are working on JuiceFS? Yeah, let me show you the GitHub repo right now. Uh, we basically are very uh, like open source native. Like the last one is committed yesterday, a few hours. Yeah, a few hours ago. And uh, we have 128 contributors. Yeah. And if somebody wants to become one of those people, how do they go about that? It just open an issue. Here, like uh, we have 1,000 already closed, 143 still opening. And if you are very familiar with uh, our uh, architecture, open the PR. Mm -hmm. And do you we have, have like, 3,000 PRs open. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a Slack or Discord community where people can ask for support? So let's say yes. they want to contribute, but they don't want don't know how or where to start, or maybe they discovered something they want to share, or maybe they yes, have a we question. do. Let's go our uh, community tab here. We have our GitHub discussion Slack, and if you join our Slack channel here, then there I'm also here. So I'm looking forward to meet more people using Josephus. So, what's the preferred way of communication? Is it GitHub discussions or Slack? Uh depends on your preference. Some okay. uh, some people like uh synchronize, I guess response immediately. They so all go mm -hmm. to Slack. If you mm -hmm. want to ask your question, then come back, check the mm -hmm. response from other people a week later, mm -hmm. then go GitHub discussion. Mm -hmm. So GitHub discussions is more like forums. Yes, basically like forums. Rather than chat. Okay. Clear. Yes. And we have a lot, I think. Yes. Oh. Yeah, we already have a lot of discussions here. Okay. And what are your plans? What do you want to work on next? Uh, the next version is in uh, is in preparing right now. It's 1.2. It's in beta right now. Our uh, Generally, our release cycle is if we have a significant feature merged, we will prepare a new, uh, a new release. So we don't have like a roadmap, a uh, very long time. So uh, if you have a PR more today, probably going to be more uh, released into the 1.3. So we are basically a community-driven uh, open source project. Do you have any advice to anyone who is watching this? Uh, I would say uh, try it in, our, uh, in your lab. Uh, either in AWS, either in your uh, bare metal deployment. If you have any questions, we are ready to answer. And uh, we really want to see who uh, wears our new uh, use cases. We knew a little bit right now uh, some, some some AI training, some uh, uh, even uh, some DNA calculations we uh, uh, we see some people is using, but. We're still looking forward to see who can find some new use cases in, uh, using our Josephus system. Okay. 
So thanks a lot, Brent. Thanks everyone for watching. Please do not forget to give them a star. And thanks, Brent, for doing the demo, for educating me on some advanced Linux commands and Thank Kubernetes uh, pers persistent volumes too. So that was fun. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Alexi. And don't forget about the star. So that's all for today. Thanks. Yeah.